Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the Senior Center and to hear our guest, John Horgan, speaking about the year without a summer. Hi, John. Hey, Chris. Thank you very much. Hey, everybody. How are you? Well, today's presentation is on the year without a summer. And here we are on the cusp of the summer solstice, the longest day of the year. There's something to be said about twilight at around 9 p.m. And up until this past week in 2018, I would have thought that maybe this is another year without a summer. You'll see some correlations tonight as we go over this program and eventually focus on the year 1816. I've been here before and it's been great. I see some familiar faces. I'm a host, writer, and co-creator of a nine-time Emmy award-winning program called The Folklorist. You can find it online on YouTube or on Vimeo. In fact, we have a segment that we produce called The Year Without a Summer that you could find on YouTube. Just put in Year Without a Summer, Folklorist, and you'll find it. Um, professional sports announcer, Boston Bruins alumni. I've gotten a chance to call a Red Sox game at Fenway Park. Work with the New England Patriots as their basketball announcer. We had our final game last night. Guys like Deron Harmon, Alandon Roberts played with us this year, James White, all good guys. Um, and also um, host golf and other assorted sports. I'm also a historian, belonging to a number of historical societies, um, and a member of Solo Together, which is a collaborative of historical reenactors. Uh, there's a, my portrayal of Alexander uh, Hamilton online, and it's awful. <laughs> so, <laughs> but as they say in the digital world, some words are spoken, can't be taken back. So, all right. So let's go here. All right, so there we go. Maybe this worked. There we go. Okay. So this is a text-driven lecture for the benefit of the hearing impaired. I do a lot of work with folks that cannot hear so well. I can hear, but my wife will tell you that I'm not a good listener. So, and also I speak too fast because I'm a hockey announcer by trade. So I apologize in advance. Only thing that I ask is to hold all of your questions until uh, the conclusion of tonight's presentation and then I will field them. So if we look at the year without a summer, we're gonna start with a period of, of weather. We're gonna talk about climate, volcanic activity, uh, uh, an anomalous year weather-wise in the year 1816, and then we'll look at the climate today. We'll look at the Little Ice Age, the wobbling sun, something known as inertial solar motion, and I'll get you out of the technical stuff quickly and easily. Solar irradiance, sunspots and their observers, some solar flares and auroras, some great volcanic eruptions, and I think that's apt where we are today with what's going on in Kilauea and what happened in Guatemala with Fuego, and I'll show you some footage of that, time permitting. We'll look at what caused one of the contributing factors of the year without a summer, a volcanic eruption uh, in Indonesia called Mount Tambora. Then a horror riding contest took place because some famous riders were forced indoors at Lake Geneva and they had to pass the time, so they had a writing contest. We'll look at the impact, especially here in New England, and then the modern year without a summer. Now, the year without a summer has several different monikers and epithets. 1800 and froze to death is my favorite. The cold summer, the poverty year, the year without summer, the summerless year of 1816, 1816 and near froze to death, year there was no summer, the mackerel year, the backward spring of 1816, and more importantly, a year without wine. So if we look at four impacts on global climate that can change it in a matter of months or years, we look at volcanic activity. That certainly contributes to the cooling of the planet. Now, some people will tell you that perhaps sunspot activity on the surface of the sun will, conti uh, will contribute to climate change. Others say that the sun's barry center, and I'll explain what that means, contributes to it, and also air pollution from modern man. So, if you look at the history of the global climate, I'm going to walk out front here, you see sine waves, right, gentle curves. Back to 2400 BC, before the 100 uh, common era, there was a warming period, a cooling period, and then they call this the very warm period when the Hebrews 1100 BC with their exodus from Egypt. And then we get to the Roman Empire warming period at zero um, CE, common era, all the way up to about uh, the year 500 AD. And then comes the Dark Ages cold period, 
followed by a medieval warming period. And again, these are all natural occurrences in climate, followed by the Little Ice Age. And this is where our story begins in the Little Ice Age. Now, if you drill down to the sine wave, you'll see that you're, these are something known as sawtooth waves, okay? So the Roman period, you'll see, I like to call them yips, perturbations. Dark Age, cold period, medieval warm period. And then we get over here to 1800, 1816, and you can see a dip in the, at the tail end of the Little Ice Age. Right about here, okay? That's the Little Ice Age. So, if you drill down to the Little Ice Age, you can see the temperatures definitely dipped below in certain areas, and right there where that arrow is, that's about the year 1816, okay? And again, just looking at some climate dips, you can see a temperential temperature changes of up to half a degree Fahrenheit, which is enormous and has an, uh, a tremendous impact on ecosystems across the globe. Around the year 1300, in a period which was known as the High Middle Ages, warm summers stopped being dependable in Northern Europe. Northern Europe was hit by plague during that period. Crops were failing. Um, at that time in medieval Europe, they didn't have the potato. They didn't have maize or corn. And they didn't have the tomato readily available as staple vegetables. And there are three cooling minima, low periods of cooling, that began in the year 1650. Again, felt here in New England by the early settlers of Boston and Plymouth. 1770, just before the American Revolution kicked off. And then the year 1850-ish, where the decade preceding 1850, Boston Harbor froze over a few times, solid. And the Little Ice Age brought colder winters to portions of Europe and North America. And in the mid-17th century, glaciers in the Swiss Alps actually advanced it was so cold, gradually engulfing farms and crushing entire villages. So now we're going to drill down within the Little Ice Age to two dips in the climate. One was known as the Maunder Minimum. And what we're talking about when we say the Maunder Minimum, we're talking about two low periods of sunspot activity. The Maunder Minimum, which took place roughly from 1645 through 1717, and it was responsible for at least 70 years of abnormally cold weather in the Northern Hemisphere. The Maunder Minimum Interval is sandwiched within the cool period, as I mentioned, known as the Little Ice Age. Now, the minimum, this dip, could be due to a lack of compiled data, because the Vatican frowned on heret heretical views that contradicted the prevailing geocentric view of our solar system. And I'll go over Galileo and his battle with Pope Urban in just a moment. But geocentric versus heliocentric. Geocentric, as proposed by the Greek philosopher Ptolemy, had the Earth at the center of the solar system and the sun revolved around the Earth, as did the planets and stars. Later, Copernicus, and I'll mention this later, said, it, no, it's a heliocentric, sun-centered solar system. Planets and the moon, the moon goes around the Earth, the planets go around the sun. So the Dalton Minimum now, which follows the Maunder, Maunder Minimum, you can see it circled there, 1816 marked an end of one of the sun's extended periods of low magnetic activity, called the Dalton Minimum, roughly from the year 1795 through 1823, as 1816 became a very active year for sunspots, beginning in the late spring, but then heightened solar activity dropped off until the year 1824. When we talk about solar cycles or sun cycles, they last roughly 11 years. And we are right now in the midst of a sunspot minima, minimal sunspots on the face of the sun, known as solar cycle 24. And I'll go back to that in here. I'm going to try to stay high level here from the technical. The other thing is the sun's movement in our solar system. During both the Dalton and the Maunder minimum, it is proposed that the sun shifted its place in the solar system. The sun doesn't stay pla in, in place. It essentially revolves around the magnetic center here. So, the sun moves its position around the solar system center of mass. This is known as inertial solar motion. There will not be a, qua a, qua a quiz after this presentation. I've all given you A's, so. All right. Scientists have not yet confirmed, though, whether this affects Earth's climate directly or indirectly. It's a possibility. 
Now, the wobbling sun, because of the gravitational pull of the planets, mostly the larger planets, the gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, the sun performs a dance around the solar system's center of gravity. Again, inertial solar motion. The sun moves around the solar system's center of mass, known as the barycenter. And they moves in cycles that repeat themselves every, we think, 178 to 180 years. Important barycenter shifts took place in 1632, 1811, and 1990. And we can equate them, in two of these cases, with cool, uh, cooling periods uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. And these shifts also preceded some of the weakest sunspot activities ever recorded. The Maunder minimum, minimum, as I said, 1645 to 1717, and the Dalton minimum, 1795 to 1823. So, the question that I like to ask is, could the movement of the sun within our solar system impact weather as the distances to the Earth decrease or increase? Something to consider. And just to drill down now, this is the center of mass, that red dot there, if that's the, the center of mass where the sun would be if it didn't move. This is where the sun was in the year 1816, and just as a matter of comparison, this is where it is today as we stand in 2018. So, let's look at sunlight. Ah, sunlight, we've waited all winter. Now, sunlight may be recorded using the sunshine recorder, a pyranometer, or a pi peer heliometer. The World Meteorological Organization, the WMO, defines sunshine as, quote, direct irradiance from the sun measured on the ground of at least 120 watts per square meter. Direct sunlight brings infrared, visible, and ultraviolet light. Bright sunlight provides luminance of approximately 100,000 candles, called candela, per square meter of surface. It's very, very bright. For instance, if you look out in the sky tonight in the west, you'll see the planet Venus. It's a minus four magnitude. To the southeast, you'll see Jupiter. It's about a minus two. The full moon is a minus 11 to a minus 12 in brightness. The sun is roughly a minus 23, just in, to associate how, what, how bright it is. But sunlight, as we know, is a key factor in photosynthesis, a process crucially important for life on Earth and to human beings, as we get vitamin D and vitamin C from sunlight. So, what is solar irradiance? Well, irradiance, or radiant emittance, and radiant excedence are radiometry terms for the power per unit of electromagnetic radiation at a surface. Whew, how hot does it get? Irradiance is used when the electromagnetic radiation is incident on the surface. It's on the ground. Radiant excedence or radiance emittance is used when the radiation is emerging from the surface. So in other words, when you see a hot day, you can see the, the or after a hot day and it rains, you can see the cloud. That's the form of radiant excedence. So, when radiation is not able to escape outside of Earth's atmosphere, it returns to the Earth, increasing atmospheric temperatures, and this is the key to the global warming theory. And I'll talk to that at the end of tonight. So it's always a polarized topic and it gets sometimes politicized. I'm, I'm an independent, I've never belonged to a political party, but, but I have my own thoughts on what's going on. I call it artificially induced climatic aberrations. So, or I'd like to say inhibited, inhibited radiant exodus. That's my term. So, if you look at 400 years of solar, solar irradiance from 1611 to the year 2001, you can see there was a low period, again, in the middle to late 17th century, the Maunder Minimum, okay? And then we have the Dalton Minimum here, which took place roughly in the early 19th century. And that's where 1816 comes about. So, now, sunspots. We talked about sunlight. What about sunspots? Well, sunspot populations quickly rise and more slowly fall on a regular cy cycle or an irregular cycle of about 11 years. As again, when they started categorizing solar cycles, we are in solar cycle 24. Over the last decades, the sun has had a markedly high average level of sunspot activity. It was last similarly active for over 8,000 years ago, and a historic solar maximum took place in the year 1958. Next up, we don't know. From 2008 to 2018, sunspot activity has dropped off dramatically. We're waiting for solar cycle 25 to begin, which will take place roughly uh, at the end of 2019, late 2019. 
Now, what are sunspots? They're manifestations of solar magnetic activity. In general, the more sunspots there are, the more active the sun is. And ironically, the sun is usually brighter when a large number of sunspots mar its visible surface as solar irradiance is increased. Okay? And we have had spotless suns, and I'll, I'll go over those graphs. But just looking at a history of solar observation, Apparent references to sunspots were first made by Chinese astronomers in 28 BC, who probably could see the largest sunspot groups when the sun's glare was filtered by windborne dust from the various Central Asian deserts, including the Gobi Desert. It obscured the sun so much so they could look directly at it and it wouldn't hurt their eyes, and there, there they could detect these magnetic storms on the surface of the sun or sunspots. Now, Charlemagne. A large sunspot was seen on the surface of the sun when he passed in 813, and people thought that would be a, a, a portent of bad luck. Sunspot activity was described in the year 1129 by John of Worcester and Avros, and he also provided a description of sunspots in the 12th century, and that's his drawing. Although I can't make out, I guess these are the sunspots up in here down, but 1129, they were observing it. And then we get to Galileo. Early incorrect scientific deductions regarding sunspots were corrected and explained by Galileo around the year 1612. Sunspots were first observed telescopically, the telescope being a new instrument of science in the early 17th century, by the English astronomer Thomas Harriot and Frisian astronomers Johannes and David Fabricius, who published a description of sunspots in June of 1611. At the latter time, though, Galileo had been showing sunspots to astronomers in Rome, while Christoph Scheiner had probably been observing the same sunspots for two or three months preceding Galileo's declaration. Now, you know Galileo is the greatest astronomer in history, at least in my opinion. He observed sunspots from his home in Padua, Italy in the year 1610. He supported Copernicus's view of a heliocentric, sun-centered solar system, and of course, this got him into a lot of trouble with Pope Urban VIII and led to a house arrest for the rest of his life after a publicized inquisition. He observed the surface of the sun at dusk through his telescope when the mist had obscured the glare so he could actually observe it, and he observed dark spots on its surface, and he applied a rotation rate to the sun. The sun actually rotates of about 25 days. Now, the wives' tale is that Galileo went blind from looking at the sun. That's not true. He contracted cataracts and glaucoma while he was in his early 70s. Another man by the name of William Herschel, born in 1738, passed in 1832. He was the first to scientifically detail and catalog sunspots, and his son John Herschel, another great astronomer, would follow in his footsteps. He discovered the outer planet Uranus on March 13, 1781, and he later discovered two moons of Saturn and two moons of Uranus and compiled extensive catalog of nebulae, gaseous clouds, out in the universe and theorized on binary star systems, stars that go around each other. He coined the term asteroid for these large chunks of rock and he discovered infrared radiation. But wait for it. He also claimed that the sun had an atmosphere and was full of living creatures. He said that on December 18, 1795, but hey, he did extensively catalog sunspot activity. Give him a pass. So, do sunspots then induce solar flares? Well, most historical data indicates yes. A sunspot is a cooler, darker region of the sun's photosphere caused by a solar magnetic disturbance. Strong, dense magnetic fields generated by circulating plasma sometimes become entangled and then surge through the sun's photosphere, creating the sunspot. They're like huge magnetic hurricanes. A solar flare is a violent eruption of plasma from the chromosphere of the sun that is whipped up by intense magnetic activity. In fact, the greatest solar flare ever was in the year 1859. At 11.18 a.m. on a cloudless morning in England, September 1st, 1859, a 33-year-old astronomer known as Richard Carrington, widely acknowledged to be one of England's foremost solar astronomers, sketched some wild mag ma magnetic activity on the surface of the sun. That's a sketch there. And as I had my walk along the Charles River the other day and some Canadian geese passed by, I said, I paused to look at a bundle they had left. I said, that looks remarkably like Carrington's first sketch. <laughs> Sorry. So, just before dawn the following day, 
Skies all over planet Earth erupted in red, green, and purple auroras, so brilliant that newspapers could be read as easily as if, at night as if you were reading them during the day. Telegraph systems worldwide went haywire as spark discharges shocked the operators and set the telegraph paper on fire. Even when telegraphers disconnected the batteries powering the lines, aurora-induced electric currents in the wires still allowed messages to be transmitted. So, the explosion for this uh, huge great solar flare of 1859 produced not only a surge of visible light, but also a mammoth cloud of charged particles and detached magnetic loops called a CME, or a coronal mass ejection. And it hurled that cloud directly towards Earth. And if this happened in today's day and age with all the satellites and electronics, right now we'd be talking by candlelight and I'd have to do hand signs to you. The next morning, when the CMA crashed into Earth, into Earth's magnetis, mag magnetic field, it caused the global bubble of magnetism that surrounds our planet to shake, quiver, and vibrate. Researchers call this a geomagnetic storm. Rapidly moving fields induced enormous electric currents that surged through telegraph lines and disrupted, disrupted communications. And even in the Rocky Mountains, the auroras were so bright that the glow awoke some gold miners who began to prepare their breakfast because they thought it was morning. Some severe solar geomagnetic storms have occurred in 1921, 1960, more recently in 2001 and 2003. The 2003 geomagnetic storm caused a blackout in the Northeast. So, if you look at some great solar flares and their associated auroras, the superstorm of August 28, 1859, December 14th, 1862, the Civil War Aurora. There was one in 1870 in October that affected Cleveland, Cincinnati, and New York City. An aurora was seen in Paris, France on February 5th, 1872. And then on August 18th, 1872, it was called the most remarkable auroral display that has occurred within the memory of the present generation, according to the New York Times. May 28th, 1877, it was observed as an arch from New York City. The aurora was seen from New York City, which is a lower latitude. Auroras are usually seen with quite regularity at higher elevations in terms of the Earth's latitude. There was a dramatic exhibition of curtains, waves, and shooting rays that extended to the zenith, which is directly overhead, and the display faded at about 10 p.m. Has anyone seen an aurora before? Oh, you have? Great. Excellent. Beautiful, isn't it? What were the colors that you remembered? Excellent. I think I remember green. Green, yep. Yep, in Iceland, yep, sure. Telegraph lines during this storm were also affected in Boston, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C. And then on August 12th, 1880, just after 9 a.m., telegraph lines in Hartford, Connecticut began to show disturbances. They pulled out the battery, aware of the 1859 shocks that telegraph operators had received, and messages could still be sent and received from Boston. But back to 11 a.m., the storm was over, and the wires were working as normal, and, and regular transmissions could be made. But oddly, after that, no aurora was seen that night. Does anybody know what a... We know the northern aurora is called the aurora borealis. What is the aurora called in the south, southern hemisphere? Sir? Aurora australis. You got it. Nicely played. Aurora australis. So... So, it's, so hopefully sometime in your lives you'll be able to see an aurora, but not here, because that's not a good sign. <laughs> Maybe farther north, northern Maine. So, astronomers who count sunspots have announced that solar cycle 24, which we're in right now, is the blankest solar cycle of the space age. And when we mean space age, we mean back to the late 1950s. But in 2009, the sun had been blank, had no visible sunspots on 260 days or 71% days of the year. And I'll tell you right now, does anybody remember the summer of 2009? It was lousy. Cool, cloudy. There were two great warm weeks that took place in the middle to late August. To find a year with more blank suns without sunspots, you have to go back to 1954, three years before the launch of Sputnik. So, radio telescopes are currently recording the dimmest sun since 1955, listening to the radio emissions from the sun itself. So if you look at this, this is an accurate sunspot count, and the red circle brings us to today. You can see that 
it was so low in the year 2008, 2009. Then we had a spike in the year 2012 and in the year 2014, but then it's dropped off dramatically. We never got to the solar maximum that we saw in solar cycle 23 <clears throat> around the turn of the century. So 2009 and 2008 still uh, mark some of the blankest half year, uh, uh, blankest years with no sunspot activity uh, in the second part of the 20th century. So my first postulate, I'm going to float three today. Has a lack of sunspots over the past 11 years in the era we're living in right now actually slowed global warming due to decreased solar irradiance? Just something to consider. And I'll go over the greenhouse effect in a moment. So again, let's head back to 1816. You can see a dip in sunspot activity. And just so you know, the prediction of sunspot activity here at peak, they say it's going to be very low up in the next few years. So solar cycle 25 will begin right here. And they don't see an, an increase, but again, eventually the roller coaster, it will awaken. So, solar minima. The Dalton and Maunder, Maunder minima were extended periods of very weak solar activity spanning about 25 years and 70 years respectively. And records from these periods show far fewer sunspots than normal, meaning the sun's magnetic activity was very weak during those years. And even though the sun is covered by relatively few dark sunspots when it is not magnetically active, it also has fewer bright regions known as plages or plages in faculi. We're almost out of the talk, technical talk. So, let's go to 1816, the year without a summer. It's spring. There were sustained periods of weak magnetic activity, making the sun slightly dimmer. So, Earth was receiving less solar light energy. The years 1812 through 1815 were nearly spotless, no sunspots. But the year 1816 had a rash of sunspots in the spring. In fact, they could be seen with the naked eye in the daytime by thousands of people over several days. There were two major periods of sunspot activity in the year 1816, beginning on May 3rd through May 10th, and again on June 11th, 1816. Many, and again, science is still relatively in its infancy there, many attributed the dank weather to the lessening amount of sunlight that was reaching the Earth. And if you stand back and look at that statement, I'd say, yeah, you, you're right but the opposite result occurred. There was also a solar eclipse in May that had nothing to do with this. So, if we look at the Connecticut Herald actually wrote verse in their paper in May of 1816, quote, all ye who tell why stars do wink, come ease my fears. What means the spot that folks may think so strange appears? As if within this ball of fire, some hole were dug or something black had settled there like any bug. So everybody was aware that there were sunspots on the surface of the sun. Now, I ask any of you, myself included, I've used some filters to see sunspots, but I've never seen any with the naked eye. And I wouldn't recommend anybody. So, my second postulate would be, had it not been for these sunspot breakouts in May and also in June of 1816, I believe that the year without a summer would have been even colder. Let's move on to volcanoes. Volcanoes are in the news. If we look at major volcanic eruptions, and I'll step out here, that have impacted America, Mount Vesuvius, Pompeii. Has anybody been to Pompeii before? You've seen the, the effect yourself. The people had no time to react to that. Literally freeze dried in, in, in place. Mount St. Helens, we know, blew in the late 1700s with geological records and stories from Native American tribes and ex ex trappers and explorers. Mount Hood, the lava dome blew in the late 18th century. In Lockie, Iceland, June of 1783, this caused worldwide climatic change. It was Benjamin Franklin when this haze came over, the pall came over New England and noticed these spectacular sunsets. He said this is due to a, um, a volcanic eruption probably in Iceland or Greenland, and he was correct. Lackey is there. Pinatubo in Luzon, Philippines, I can remember that. The beautiful summer of 91, 91 through 93. 93 was a little cooler, spectacular sunsets. And then, and you can say this along with me, in Iceland, 2010, it actually stopped air traffic for five days in April. I Jav Jala Jokel. Say it. I Jav Jala Jokel. And then you can wipe your mouth. Okay. So. And of course, right now, going on in Kilauea, 
You can see. This is a civil defense message for Saturday, June 16th at 6 p.m. Hawaiian Volcano Observatory reports that Fisher 8 in the Lower East Rift Zone continues Kilauea, to... Kilauea, as you know, people are losing their homes. ...and is flowing into the ocean at Kapo'o. The main island of Hawaii expanding in size. ...and is being monitored closely. Civil defense authorities are advising people of the following for information on the East Rift Zone eruption. So... There is no immediate threat. Please only act on information obtained... Look at that lava river. ...for monitoring the volcano. And if you look at three, basically three different types of eru eruptions, you have lava flows like this with no pyroclastic flow. I'm going to show you a pyroclastic flow here in Guatemala. That's where an explosion happens. It happened in Pompeii with these huge uh, clouds of gas and ash come tumbling down, sometimes forming a mudslide called a lahar and can bury people instantaneously. And then you have these mega volcano eruptions like in Tambora that um, expound ash up into the stratosphere. Let's just take a look at this. Uh, this is terrifying. These people, for years, this was a dormant volcano in Guatemala. Look at this cloud, people trying to outrace it. Of course, the only thing we've experienced in the United States since Kilauea was Mount St. Helens in May of 1980. And look at this, the people were surprised, killed hundreds, here comes the cloud. Look at this, how do you get away from that? Terrifying. And of course, this man taking a selfie. Uh, sir, uh, sir, you wanna move? Sir, you wanna run? And of course, you don't want to inhale that. That's going to ruin your day. So, so anyways. So those are the two most recent volcanic events in uh, May and June of, of the year 2018. There are other great volcanic winter events that include uh, in 1628 BC, the Minoan eruption of Santorini. Has anybody been to Santorini? Wow, there you go. Cool. Great. So you know all about that. Huge eruption there. Um, could have caused flooding. Oh, yeah, it did cause flooding. And then uh, Lake uh, Taupo's Hatepe eruption around 180 AD. There was an extreme weather event. We can't really track it down to a specific volcano, but there was cooling in 535 and 536. There was a great famine from the years 1315 to 1317 caused by the eruption of um, Kaharoa in New Zealand. In 1452 and 53, we thought the, an underwater volcano called Kauai erupted. 1600, the Huai Napatina eruption caused a famine in Russia from 1601 to 1603. And then Krakatoa, where about 36,600 people died and there was 500, five years of cold weather, especially felt in the Northern Hemisphere. And of course, Mount Pinatubo, 91 through 93, uh, the summers were cooler than average. So back to 1815, this is when it begins, the year without a summer. Mount Tambora, which is known as a strato of volcano in Sumbawa, Indonesia, became highly active, first in 1812, and it erupted on April 10th and April 11th, 1815. So, Tambora located in Indonesia, you can see it there into the center of the screen. Crater still, it literally blew its top off. It's about 57,000 years old. So, Ancient eruptions there we know took place roughly in 3910 BC, 3050 BC, and 70, 740 AD. So it hadn't gone off um, for over a thousand years. The first eruption took place on April 5th, 1815. Thunder was heard from 250 miles away. Then the major blast occurred on April 10th and April 11th, 1815, heard from 1,600 miles away, such to be, to, to be thought by some soldiers that there were cannons firing and a war was about to begin. There's a close above Tambora, it's a crater. But about a seven o'clock p.m. local time, April 10th, 1815, the eruptions intensified. Three columns of flame rose up and merged and the whole mountain was turned into a flowing mass of liquid fire. Pumice stones of up to eight inches in diameter started to rain down at approximately 8 p.m., followed by ash at 9 to 10 p.m. And then hot pyroclastic flows cascaded down the mountainside to the sea on all sides of the peninsula, wiping out the village of Tambora. Loud explosions were heard until the next evening. An ash veil cloud spread as far west as West Java and South Sulawesi. This eruption was four times larger than Krakatoa in 1883. Sir Thomas Raffles, British officer, heard it and he said, quote, 
The noise, and I apologize for the Cockney accent, that's poor, but I'm working on it. The, the noise was, in the first instance, almost universally attributed to distant cannon. So much so that a detachment of troops were marched from Jogjakarta in the expectation that a neighboring post was being attacked. And along the coast, boats were in two instances dispatched in quest of a supposed ship in distress. They didn't know what it was. They heard it. Pitch darkness was observed as far away as 370 miles from the mountain summit for up to two days. Pyroclastic flow spread at least 12 miles from the summit, and all vegetation on the island was destroyed, uprooting trees mixed with pumice ash washed into the sea, and they formed rafts of all these destroyed trees, similar to Mount St. Helens, for up to three miles across of dead trees. Clouds of thick ash covered the summit on April 23rd, and the explosions finally uh, ceased in the middle of July 1815, although smoke emissions were still observed as late as August 23rd. Flames and rumbling aftershocks were reported in August 1819, four years after the event. And a tsunami struck the shores of various islands in the Indonesian archipelago on April 10th with a height of up to 13 feet in Sangar at around 10 o'clock at night. And another tsunami, smaller, six feet in height, was reported in Basuki, East Java, before midnight. So, the eruption column reached the stratosphere at an altitude of more than 140,000 feet. The coarser ash particles fell one to two weeks later after the eruptions, but the finer ash, the particles stayed aloft in the upper atmosphere for a few months up to a few years, anywhere from an altitude from 33,000 to 100,000 feet. Then, longitudinal winds spread these fine particles around the globe, creating optical phenomena. Prolonged and brilliantly colored sunsets and twilights were frequently seen in London, England between June 28th and July 2nd, 1815, and again September 3rd uh, through October 7th, 1815. The glow of the twilight sky typically appeared orange or red near the horizon and purple or pink above. Did anybody see the spectacular sunsets we had last week? There are two of them. There's nothing like a great sunset. I've been told that once the sun, if you're in a proper angle, once the sun sets, that just for a moment, for a millisecond, there's a green flash, they call it, when the sun sets. I've never seen it. Anyways, when Tambora erupted, 75,000 people died. 10,000 direct deaths were caused by the eruption, pyroclastic flows. On Sumbawa Island, there were another 38,000 deaths, which were attributed to starvation, and 10,000 more deaths occurred due to disease and hunger on Lombok Island. So Indonesia was... was um, strafed by this volcano. Sulfur poured into the stratosphere and it, called a, it caused a GCA, known as a Global Climate Anomaly. In the spring and summer of 1816, then a persistent, what they call dry fog, was observed in the northeastern United States. The fog reddened and dimmed the sunlight such that sunspots were visible to the naked eye. Because this ash veil dimmed out the sun, you could look at it with the naked eye. But Neither wind nor rain could disperse this fog because it was such at a high altitude, high above any storm clouds. Then, average global temperatures decreased about 0.7 to 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit, enough to cause significant agricultural problems around the globe, especially the Northern Hemisphere. We know that 1816 was the second coldest year in the Northern Hemisphere since AD 1400, after 1601 following the Hue na Patina eruption in Peru. But we know that the 1810s are the coldest decade on record, a result of Tambor's 1815 eruption and other suspected eruptions somewhere between 1809 to say 1810, 1812. And with a cooler summer, parts of Europe experienced a stormier winter. So, this pattern of climate anomaly has been blamed for the severity of typhus epidemic in southeastern Europe and the eastern Mediterranean between the years 1816 and 1819. After famine comes disease. Much livestock died in New England during the winter of 1816 to 1817. Cool temperatures and heavy rains resulted in failed harvests in the UK. Families in Wales traveled long distances as refugees begging for food. Famine was prevalent in North and Southwest Ireland following the fa failure of wheat, oat, and potato harvest. Now keep in mind, the, the blight wouldn't take place until the late 1840s in Ireland. 
The crisis was so severe in Germany, where food prices rose sharply, and due to the unknown cause of the problems, demonstrations began, social unrest in front of the grain markets and bakeries, and then the riots ensued. Arson, looting took place in many European cities. No food, no social order. It was the worst famine of the 19th century. So, aside from Mount Tambora, there were other volcanic eruptions that really exacerbated this cooling down of the earth. Other large volcanic eruptions took place at around the same time. In 1812, La Soufriere on St. Vincent Island in the Caribbean went off. Also in 1812, Awu on Sangihe Islands in Indonesia went off. 1813, Ryukyu Islands in Japan had an eruption. And Mayon in the Philippines, 1814. So you had all these additional four eruptions that helped compound the misery that Mount Tambora did with its major eruption. So the results, these other eruptions had already built up a substantial amount of atmospheric dust prior to the eruption of Mount Tambora, the largest in 1,600 years. As is common following a massive volcanic eruptions, temperatures fell worldwide because less sunlight passed through the atmosphere. So historian John D. Post has called this the last great subsistence crisis in the Western world. The unusual climatic aberrations of 1816 had the greatest effect right here in New England, in the Northeast, the Canadian Maritimes, Newfoundland, and Northern Europe. Typically, the late spring and summer of the Northeastern U.S. and Southeastern Canada are relatively stable. Temperatures average of both day and night, about, they average about anywhere from 68 degrees to 77 degrees Fahrenheit and rarely fall below 41 degrees Fahrenheit. You will recall two weeks ago, they got into the high four, 40s in Central Mass at night. I'm always concerned whenever I hear about volcanic eruptions because I believe that Earth, Gaia, is covered with living creatures, insects, plants, animals, humans, and who's to say that, that doesn't, it doesn't have a consciousness and when it gets too hot, it cools itself down by letting off the volcanoes. Couple that with all sorts of drilling, tectonic plate movement and shifts, so, summer snow is an extreme rarity, though May flurries sometimes occur. Does anybody remember the snowstorm of May 1977? <laughs> in China, the cold weather killed trees, rice crops, and even water buffalo, especially in northern China, and floods destroyed many remaining crops. Mount Tambor's eruption disrupted China's monsoon season, resulting in overwhelming floods in the Yangtze Valley in 1816. The, in, in India, the delayed summer monsoon caused late torrential rains that aggravated the spread of cholera from a region near the River Ganges in Bengal as far as Moscow. In May 1816, frost killed off most of the crops that had been planted in New England. In June of 1816, two large snowstorms in eastern Canada and New England resulted in many human deaths. Nearly a foot of snow was observed in Quebec City in early June 1816, with consequential additional loss of crops. The result was regional malnutrition, starvation, epidemic, and increased mortality. In short, that's famine. In July and August, lake and river ice were observed as far south as Pennsylvania. Rapid, dramatic temperature swings were common, with temperatures sometimes reverting from normal or above normal summer temperatures as high as 95 degrees Fahrenheit to near freezing within a matter of hours. Even though farmers south of New England did succeed in bringing some crops to maturity, maize, corn, and other grain prices rose dramatically. Those areas suffering local crop failures had to deal with the lack of roads in the early 19th century, which prevented easy importation of bulky foodstuffs on wagons when you had to go through these muddy, rutted roads or dry roads. So, in the ensuing bitter winter, and this is just an add-on here, of 1817, the thermometer dropped to minus 26 degrees below zero, and the waters of New York's upper bay froze so hard that horse-drawn sleighs were driven across Buttermilk Channel from Brooklyn to Governor's Island. In eastern Switzerland, the summers of 1816 and 1817 were so cool that an ice dam formed below a tongue of the Gietro Glacier high in the Val de Bagnes. 
In spite of the efforts of the engineers to drain the growing lake, the ice dam collapsed catastrophically in June of 1818, drowning 55. And that's the glacier. So, there are also luminous snowstorms, electrical snowstorms. We know them as thunder snow. In fact, we had some thunder snow, I believe, in early March here, right? In Vermont, in both January and February of 1817, where ball lightning actually shocked many people. And I did a, if you go to historicalaudio.net, you'll see I've done a number of recordings about this phenomena. Many New England farmers were wiped out. And tens of thousands of people struck out for the richer soil and better growing conditions of the upper Midwest. They said, we've had it with New England, with the rocky soil and the weather. We're striking out for better conditions. So that's actually what helped the move westward in the United States in the early 19th century. So here's a question. Tambora erupted in 1815. May of 1815. So why wasn't the summer of 1815 rather than the summer of 1816 the year without a summer? Answer is there's a time lag between a volcanic eruption and a change in weather patterns caused by the length and time needed for stratospheric winds to distribute the volcanic dust particles around the globe. It takes a while. Tambora being in the southern hemisphere, they had to circle their way around the globe. So Europe was still recovering from the Napoleonic Wars in the early 19th century, and also the subsequent food shortages. France was a terrible place to be starting in 1789, right through the, the uh, scourge of Napoleon. Food riots broke out in Great Britain and France, and grain warehouses were looted. Believe it or not, the worst violence was in landlocked Switzerland, where famine caused the government to declare a national emergency. So you had huge storms, Abnormal rainfall with flooding of the major rivers of Europe, including the Rhine. They were also attributed to this event, as was the frost setting in during August of, eight, uh, of 1816. So not only did you have no summer, but you had an early winter. So, a BBC documentary using figures compiled in Switzerland estimated that fatality rates in the year 1816 were twice that of average years, given an approximate European fatality total of 200,000 deaths during the year without a summer. And in fact, the lack of transportation inspired Carl Dreis to develop the modern bicycle. This is known as a velocipede. I don't know how you could ride that. Carefully, exactly. Of course, does anybody know the great British painter J.M.W. Turner? Some people believe that high ash levels in the atmosphere led to unusually spectacular sunsets during this period, featured in his celebrated painters of paintings of Turner. And it's been theorized that this is Chichester Canal, circa 1828, that because of the Volcanic ash that was still circulating in the stratosphere actually uh, caused brilliant sunsets, and that inspired him to paint. So, the crop failures of the year without a summer, as I mentioned, forced families to migrate westward to better weather conditions, including Joseph Smith, who moved from Sharon, Vermont, to Palmyra, New York, precipitating a series of events culminating in the publication of the Book of Mormon and the founding of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The chemist, Justus von Liebig, who had experienced the famine as a child in Darmstadt, later studied the nutrition of plants and introduced mineral fertilizers. Near Iceland, sea ice persisted into June of 1816. In Ireland, persistent cold and rain for 142 of 153 summer days. The grapes in the Champagne district of Verdun froze in the cold summer and never ripened as vineyards across Fan, Fa, France suffered a similar fate. Only a few grapes ripened in the autumn months and the 1816 grape harvest of France was practically non-existent due to the cold summer. It was the year without wine and that would add to social unrest. <laughs> wine was hard to come by for the next few years from 1816 to 1818. So, because of the disastrous crop of grapes from withered vineyards, wine growers had to seek alternative areas to cultivate their vineyards. As the year without a summer was mostly a northern hemispheric event, entrepreneurs sought out suitable lands and their associated climate to establish vineyards. 
They went to South America, Brazil and Argentina. We all love South American wines. Australia and New Zealand, they have great wines as well. California and Eastern Europe, including the Balkans. So, in response to the food shortage caused by the year without a summer, the British government abolished income taxes in the year 1816. And in January of 1816, a blizzard of brown snow hit Hungary. Des described as flesh-colored, the snow's unusual color was the result of mixing with volcanic dust from, I say Mount Tambora here, but actually it was the other volcanic eruptions before that preceded Tambora that caused that. And in the spring of 1816, Italy experienced red and amber-colored snow. In Madrid, temperatures were below 59 degrees Fahrenheit in July and August. Has anybody been to Madrid before? It's hot during the summer. In that autumn, the Catalan peaks of Montserrat and Montseny in the Caribbean were covered with snow, and the Lobregat River froze completely over. One of my favorite painters is Peter Bruegger the Elder, and this is Hunters in the Snow, but just to give you an idea of what it was like then. And of course, the food shortage in Canada aggravated a trade dispute over pemmican, which was a concentrate of meat, berries, and fat, yum, between Hudson Bay's, uh, Hudson's Bay Company, some trappers, and the Northwest Company. This triggered the June 1816 Battle of Seven Oaks where 24 people were killed. Now, on to the writing contest. Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin Shelley, born in 1797, died in the year 1851. She married romantic poet philosopher Percy Bysshe Shelley in 1816. And he was still married when they began their courtship. His wife Harriet, unfortunately depressed, committed suicide. But she was of good stock. Mary's parents were political philosopher William Godwin, and her mother was the philosopher and feminist Mary Wollstonecraft. Now, Mary Shelley, or Mary Godwin Shelley, in 1816, the couple, who had not married yet, spent a summer with Lord Byron, author John William Polidori, and Claire Claremont at the Via Diodati in the village of Cologny on Lake Geneva in Switzerland. There's Mary. Lord Byron, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley. And he rented Maison Chapuis nearby, Percy Bysshe did. They arrived on May 14, 1816, where Mary called herself Mrs. Shelley. And of course, Lord Byron, the great poet, joined them there on the 25th of May. And he had some money, so. They passed the time writing, boating when they could, and talking late into the night. Mary said that it proved a wet, ungenial summer, and incessant rain often confined us for days to the house. Amongst the subjects that they talked about, and again, you had some of the great writers of, of England at that time, the conversation turned to the experiments of the 18th century natural philosopher and poet Erasmus Darwin, who was said to have had, who claimed to have animated dead animals, dead matter, into the feasibility of returning a corpse or assembled body parts to life. Gave Mary an idea. So, they sat around the fire at Lord Byron's magnificent vi villa, and the company also amused themselves by reading German ghost stories, prompting Byron to suggest that, why don't we each write our own supernatural tale? So, shortly afterwards though, Mary, in a waking dream, conceived the idea for Frankenstein. She said, quote, I saw the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out, and then, on the working of some powerful engine, show signs of life, and stir with an uneasy, half vital motion. Frightful must it be, for supremely frightful would be the effect of any human endeavor to mock the stupendous mechanism of the creator of the world. That's Herman Munster, that's not Frankenstein. <laughs> So, she began writing what she assumed would be a short story. But with Percy Shelley's encouragement, she expanded this tale into her first novel called Frankenstein, or The Modern Prometheus, published first in the year 1818. She later described that summer in Switzerland as the moment when I first stepped out from childhood into life. And Let's give this guy some credit. This is John William Paul Dory, also there with his mistress during that trip. And he would write the classic novel, The Vampire, 
long before Bram Stoker during that session. So, let's go back to New England as we finish up here. In New England, the summer of 1816 included some early June snow, cold nights in both July and August. And the widespread frost at low-level sites around New England on July 8th and July 9th, 1816, and the damaging frosts on August 22nd, as winter came early, from interior New England all the way south into North Carolina. There were droughts, too, and finally, killing frosts in September, such as that of the September 27th frost in New England. Right before, some farmers didn't harvest their crop, and they lost it. So, this led to crop failures, food shortages, and helped stimulate the move westward. In Connecticut, in parts of New York State, frosts in April are rare, but in 1816, frosts were recorded in every month of the year. Summer temperatures were slightly below average, and 5.4 to 9 degrees Fahrenheit below average, depending upon which source you choose to believe. There are so many sources and books that came out in 1816, 1817. But the most severe cold snap came in early June, and it killed the vegetable crop in parts of New England, ruining some farmers. Now, keep in mind that New England during this time not only was a major... Uh, fishing center with Gloucester, Marblehead, Provincetown, Boston, but also we had marvelous uh, orchards, alp apples, pears, and, and peaches. They suffered too. So the cider crop was, also went down. It was a year without cider as well. The worst of the weather was certainly in northern New England, but conditions during the summer were also summer-like at times, wild fluctuations. For example, a late June heat wave saw the temperatures top 90 degrees Fahrenheit between the 22nd and 24th of June, and temperatures were near normal for much of the first two-thirds or first two-and-a-half weeks of August. But it also sh should be pointed out that since 1816, it's been just as cold or even colder in each of the summer months, but never in consecutive months. So, the most notorious part of the year without a summer in 1816 here in New England was early June when a cold snap came in. June began promising enough, and on the 5th of June in New England, they climbed into the 88 to 91 degrees Fahrenheit range. And in fact, in Salem, it reached 90 degrees Fahrenheit. But during the afternoon of June 5th, Thundery showers broke out over New England, and later in the day, a cold front swept across the region, dragging cold air down from Canada in its wake. The next day, the 6th, was much colder, as some places were as much as 49 degrees Fahrenheit colder than the day before. And in parts of Vermont and in Boston, temperatures reached little more than 45 degrees Fahrenheit in June. Now, during the next two or three days, cold conditions turned even colder and the precipitation that fell became increasingly wintry in nature. In fact, on June 7, 1816, snow fell over the northern highlands of New England, but there were also snow flurries in parts of Connecticut and Massachusetts, like Salem, and snow fell as far south as the town of Abington, Massachusetts. In fact, snow flurries were reported on Boston Common, June 7, 1816. On that day, the ground was white with snow in Newton, Massachusetts, and in Waltham, Mass., the temperature dropped to 35 degrees Fahrenheit. Way up north in Danville, Vermont, snowdrifts over 34 inches in height were reported. Contemporary reports spoke of prolonged falls of snow and snow settling and lying on the ground for a few days. But by June 10th and June 11th, conditions began to improve but mornings were still frosty. By the 12th of June, 1816, temperatures were rather more normal. And in the 36 degree Fahrenheit to 49 degree Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit, they were, and then they stayed there until the 22nd to the 24th, when something of a heat wave developed. And during these three days, the temperatures went from 36 degrees Fahrenheit to 49 degrees Fahrenheit, all the way up to 90 degrees. On June 23rd, 99 degrees was recorded in Waltham, Massachusetts. Think about that. And just two weeks earlier, a little over two weeks earlier, there was snow. And also Salem topped out at 99 degrees Fahrenheit. Boston was in the high 90s. It was a heat wave. But July 1816 was notable for a lack of warm nights, which it turns out are necessary because they allow corn to grow and ripen. Some of the coldest nights 
were on July 8th and July 9th when a light fro ground frost affected some areas in the upper Connecticut Valley and at Middlebury, Middlebury, Windsor, and Williamstown in Vermont. In fact, it was recorded at 44 degrees at sunrise in Waltham, Mass. on July 8th. And July 1816 was also a very dry month, and drought, along with the cold, began to impact the harvest in parts of New England. As we moved into August, temperatures were normal for the first two and a half weeks of the month and peaked in the low 90s on the 18th and 19th, but it was still dry. Then, an active cold front came down on the 20th, leading to a cooling down and a couple of spells of frosty nights during the last third of the month, which wiped out all the crops in some northern parts of New England. Contemporary reports mention snow-covered mountains. And Mount Washington obviously was covered in snow, but some of the White Mountains were covered in snow. Cool conditions in late August persisted through September, which ended with a series, September 27th, of crop-killing frosts. Farmers were in their fields as if it was late December, and animals seemed to be moving about in a confused and lethargy, just moving around. They didn't know what to do. So, let's close it up here. The combined influences of the sun's changes and magnetism, a major volcanic eruption with ash clouds and sulfur aerosols spewed by this volcano were widespread, chilling the climate of the northern hemisphere, blocking out sunlight, with gases and particles, and possibly even the wobbling of the sun's position were responsible for famine, drought, and destructive snows and rains in the Northern Hemisphere, especially New England in the years 1816 and 1817. There are diary entries and newspaper accounts abound of the unusual spring and summer in the Northern Hemisphere. For instance, in Franconia, New Hampshire, an 88-year-old physician by the name of Edward Holyoke, an amateur astronomer and meteorologist, wrote in his detailed records, in fact, a lot of these gentlemen kept diaries of the weather and wind conditions, and he did it for 80 years, every single day, he wrote something. But on June 7th, he said, quote, exceedingly cold, ground frozen hard, and squalls of snow throughout the day, icicles 12 inches long in the shade at noonday. June 7th, sleet fell in the northeastern U.S. and snowdrifts remained two feet deep in late spring. Sheep froze in meadows and small birds were easily caught by reason of the cold. They were so lethargic they could be caught. And others were found dead in fields. Another man, physician William Bentley, wrote in Waltham, Mass. on June 12th, quote, In few seasons have we heard more bitter complaints against cold weather than since June has come in. Again, there was frost on July 8th in Waltham. Others recorded killer droughts and a strange tepid dryness wafting on northwest winds. In fact, a vivid impression of that summer in the northeastern United States appeared in verse. The trees were all leafless, the mountains were brown, the face of the country was scathed with a frown, and bleak were the hills and the foliage sere as had never been seen at that time of the year. So, at certain degree of normalcy then returned. In some coastal areas, the weather was bland and agreeable, according to Holyoke. And he said that basically the, the days from June 17th through August 17th were uniformly fine. But then he said that the, he was confident that the crop outlook could have been, couldn't have been better anticipated. And then the killing frosts came. It started about August 21st. The frost came, snows killed off the meager bean and corn crop. The fields were as empty and white as October, he said. It impacted, as I mentioned, from southern Canada all the way down to northern Car North Carolina. Cold struck again on September 11th, and this was known as the pro poverty year because farmers lost their shirts literally because they couldn't bring their crop to market. Thomas Jefferson, at his home in Monticello in Virginia, again, at the end of his political career, recorded the severe weather in 1816 in his diary. And he was one of many observers who recorded unusually cold weather during the summer of 1816. It also impacted his vineyards and his grapevines. But bad weather, for all intent and purpose, was recorded all over the world. So that's what happened during the year without a summer. Now let's talk about today. And then we'll wrap it up here. You've heard about the greenhouse effect, 
where essentially some of the uh, infrared radiation passes through the atmosphere, but is absorbed and re-emitted in all directions by greenhouse gases, the gas molecules and clouds. And the effect of this is to warm the Earth's surface and the lower atmosphere. In other words, solar radiation comes in, but can't escape. The heat is trapped. About half of the sun's radiation is absorbed by the Earth. So, global warming, or as I call it, um, inhibited radiant exudants, or artificially induced climatic aberrations. Earth's temperatures are rising. Greater than 90% of excess heat is trapped by greenhouse gases that is, then is absorbed into our oceans that cover two-thirds of the planet's surface. Therefore, ocean temperatures are rising. Polar ice caps are melting. It's called a crude heat. Not only is the amount of warming significant, but the pace is alarming. Something known as the thermohaline or thermohaline circulation, melting polar ice caps desalinate or reduce the salt content of the thermohaline circulation, which are oceanic currents like the Gulf Stream which cause them to sink to oceanic depths and alter its path, flow, and rate. Climate change in certain areas are kept warm by the Gulf Stream. For instance, Boston here, where we are, 42 degrees north latitude. England is 10 degrees farther north, but they enjoy temperate climate just as we do. So if the Gulf Stream sinks or alters, then the UK will suffer drastic climate change and they will become cooled as they should be at 52 degrees north latitude. You also have the jet stream, the polar jet, the subtropical jet. The jet stream also in influences climate and weather. Reduced polar ice caps and extreme oceanic heating can cause perturbations or irregular shifts in the jet stream. We've all heard about the polar vortex. That's when the polar jet dips down bringing frigid air from the Arctic along with it. And then you have the greenhouse effect, which I touched on, where most of the radiation is absorbed by the Earth's surface and warms it. But here's a question. What if air pollution in the future becomes so bad that sunlight can't even penetrate our atmosphere and get to the surface of the Earth? It comes in, but it's deflected. What happens after global, cooling, uh, global warming? Global cooling. Without adequate sunlight due to a thick cloak of air pollution, global cooling was, would most surely ensue. Again, deflected. In 1980, there were approximately 425,000 vehicles operating globally. Today, there are over 1 billion automobiles operating globally. Over the last 40 years, global air travel has almost increased eightfold. In 1974, airplanes carried 421 million people globally. In 2014, this number increased to 3.2 billion passengers. And you can see the associated graph. And of course, planes leave contrails. 10 million factories are operating in the world today compared with 436,000 in the year 1980. Now, they are doing um, uh, emissions and trying to prevent greenhouse gas emissions. So mostly that is in the United States, in North America, Western Europe, um, Russia and China are now realizing, and India, that the pollutants that they emit up into the air come right back down to the earth and affect their population. But as you know, world population growth, I mean, if you look at, uh, we're well less than a billion. We didn't really hit a billion people uh, until about the 20th century, but it's skyrocketing to over 8 billion people predicted by the year 2025. So another postulate, the final postulate for me. Sunlight reaching the earth is gradually diminishing due to pollution particles aloft. Again, my theory. A study of sunlight was underway in the United States when the 9-11 attacks took place on September 11, 2001. With air traffic grounded, scientists noticed a 20% increase in sunlight and water evaporation rates during the three days of essentially clear skies. No commercial airliners. This controversial phenomena is known as global dimming. So, and I'll close here. 
Could global warming be a temporary precursor to global cooling? Air pollution may one day block out the sun and quickly bring on a deadly cooling period, which would cause, just like the year without a summer, starvation and disease. This phenomena, I believe, would then be exacerbated when people begin burning items, whatever they can get their hands on, in their fireplaces to stay warm. It's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, if we stop artificially induced climatic change by reducing air pollution in our own individual carbon footprint, we're all guilty, and we, maybe we can halt or slow down global dimming, which could prevent global cooling. Part of reducing our carbon footprint, recycling, reuse, reduce, turning off lights when we don't need them, only using potable water when we need it, and basically driving to and from, and I think that higher gas prices, you're going to see them go north of $4, in my opinion, in the coming uh, 12 to 18 months, that people will drive less. So, otherwise, unless we act now, my belief is that we could face famine, disease, and starvation during the decades without a summer. That's my talk. Thank you so much for your patience.